Welcome ASLer and ASLSK players. We are previewing and checking out one of the scenarios, probably the best scenario of this pack here that MMP just released. And uh, the maps are yet to be on Vazel yet, but we uh, did a couple scans, put things on, uh, actually not scans at all. These are maps, the only scenario that does not use the maps. And so we went with it. Not coincidentally, that scenario is none other than Neil Eulen's, you know, creme de la creme um, bucket list item. So we're going to take a look at it. We're going to take a look at the uh, scenario special rules as we do with all the other games and see how he's pieced together a very fine scenario and a very tough fight. And I love the SSRs. It makes the map look interesting. It makes the play interesting. And um, this is what you guys can do if you develop a scenario. And instead of just having, oh, you get fighter support on turn five, or, or you get OBA on this thing, this turn over here. With SK, you've got to kind of bend the rules, for, for, so to speak, because those rules don't exist in SK. But there's no reason why you can't do this in ASL. Uh, it's far easier. It produces the same, if not better, effect most of the time, um, especially in SK, because again, you don't have the rules for these things. So let's take a look into this masterpiece, and hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as I do and appreciate the hard work in playtesting and developing a scenario of your own. So let's head to it. Let's hit, hit the beaches. And let's start making some mayhem. All right, here we are. The gorgeous cover from ASL Starter Kit Expansion Pack. Man, that's a mouthful. Number three. As you see, not only does it have Japanese, as many of the other expansion packs may have just been strictly Japanese and Chinese. It has the Italians. It has the Germans. The Russians, the Poles, mm, uh, Commonwealth, French, what have you, I have no clue. And the Americans. And uh, nope, not a complete product. Prior modules are required to play scenarios. I think that's the rule for all expansion packs, hence the name expansion. And um, yeah, I love the cover. It's gray, uh, kind of resembles, you know, it reflects the... Uh, start kit number three as being gray as well and also matches uh, I think it matches the chapter D color I hadn't actually noticed that that was the case huh huh what the hell so uh, starter kit number one matches chapter A jeez where the hell have I been uh, starter kit number two matches chapter or chapter C and starter kit number three matches chapter uh, D. Um, I think they broke the mold of we'll starter kit number four being yellow. That's like uh, chapter H. It's like design your own. But uh, if it were green, uh, who knows? Who? Anyhow, making mayhem. ASL S95 out of the expansion pack three. Scenario designer Neil Yulin. We all know and love Neil. So Take a look at his scenario here. It uses boards M and L. I think it's L instead of I. Hell, you don't know with these damn starter kit boards. So hopefully I chose the right board. Um, Japanese-American conflict. Small unit density. Let me zoom in real quick. Small unit density on the here. Um, seven squads. Ten squads on the opposite side. Pretty, pretty much an even fight. And... Um, and uh, the Japanese are defending small village, and the Americans have to come on uh, multiple edge hexes. And again, that's part of your strategy. I love multiple ch uh, multiple edges. It makes you choose uh, one over the other. And uh, they all can come in one side. They could split, or they can go on on the other side. So uh, it's a wonderful uh, option that you have for that. So let's go ahead and dig into it. Um, I think this one, I don't want to say it's pretty straightforward, but uh, the language seems pretty clear. And uh, 
So let's take a look at the let's take a look at the victory conditions. Again, scrolling up top, you see the uh, the half maps again. Nice, easily playable area. Not you know using the amount of map that you need to use in this particular scenario. You know he could have added the rest of it. There's no point if most of the combat's in one area. So be, be that as may, it's I think it's a nice tight little scenario. Of course. If you're playing face to face, you would have these map sections laid out anyway. So, but you'd have your charts laying over it. So, victory conditions very simple. Again, keep it simple so your players don't get lost. So, the Americans win at game end. The Americans win at game end by controlling hexes MI8, ML7, LX8, LY8, and LZ5. So, five hexes note that it does not say buildings or huts it's the hexes that they must control and we'll check that on the map um and you'll see in one of these instances i think it's x8 y8 where it's the same building so if you happen to um control the building you may not control the hex so that's very important to understand controlling the hexes can be different and usually is different so um the hex was over here balance is uh actually kind of nice six strafing attacks that's a scenario special rule and adding a leader to the american turn one ob i think that's an excellent ssr balance feature because if the americans split their forces they only have one leader per side if they split which can be hazardous to your health if your leader is a goner all right so adding an additional leader gives you extreme versatility in, uh, and mobility for that matter in this scenario, especially since you have to make up some ground. Again, six and a half turns, which means it's seven American action turns and six Japanese turns. So if the Americans uh, capture uh, or control, rather control the hexes, MI8, one of, you know, one of those five or each of those five at turn seven, the Japanese cannot counterattack. Um, doesn't matter if the Americans get eliminated at that point. So they've got to be prevented from entering those hexes prior to that. And the turn number one and turn number three are American reinforcements and also Japanese reinforcements on three, obviously. Note right here on, on turns one and two, you will see a distinction in scenario color. And so what that does you should should ring some bells like hmm what the hell is that you know asl players will recognize this sk players may or may not depending on how much sk you've played so since this is slightly wonky you expect to see some sort of explanation to it on the bottom so before we get to the the scenario special rules we're just going to quickly going over the ob's here and uh they are actually really straightforward uh, not a lot of bling in this one, but you have some important pieces of equipment that you have to look at. Five Japanese squads, a crew, obviously the crew with the, with the Japanese rules must man, well, it doesn't have to man the MMG, but it mans the MMG without penalties. You could put the MMG with one of the squads. You could, that's a possibility, and put the crew with the mortar. Choice is yours, but they would be subject to some penalties in operational use. Let me scroll out a little bit here. Uh, reinforcements coming in, two, three, four, sevens. I kind of actually like these three, four, sevens because they're kind of garbage, but they're Japanese. And so with an eight, zero Japanese leader and two little shit squads against these five, five, eights, um, normally in a scenario, that doesn't involve Japanese, those are garbage. But with Japanese and their ability to jump in close combat and engage hand-to-hand, -hand, uh, they can spell doom to anyone they attack. And uh, they bring on a little light machine gun with them. So the Japanese have in their OB three lights and a medium machine gun and a mortar. That's five support weapons for seven units. Pretty damn good. And three leaders for seven units. So you might have some 
bonsai capability, but you certainly have some morale boosting effect going on there. Americans, uh, first thing you should note on the American side um, is nine minus two. That's a big boy. That's the big boy of the game right there. Nine minus one Japanese leader, not concerned about it. Nine minus two American leader spells death. Uh, you probably don't want to take him into close combat, especially with any of the American, the Japanese units. The um, Japanese 347 engaging in close combat with the 9 minus 2 and a 558 is a 6 for a casualty reduction. So um, that's pretty easy to kill. So 5, 4, 3, 2, they're goners, 6, he could be gone. Um, so American OB, very simple, pretty much 10, five, five, eights, three liters, uh, two mediums, right? Mediums, uh, long range fire. Maybe what the mediums could be used for in this one, uh, tallied with either of these leaders is, um, using their modifiers to penetrate some of the, uh, hindrances. We do have lots of hindrances in this, as in most PTO scenarios. So um, look to be able to have to fire through uh, some uh, hindering terrain. So let's look at the scenario special rules. And uh, oh, the ELRs mm, probably won't come into play in this one. ELR 3, pretty solid. ELR 5, invulnerable in ASL and uh, SK terms. So you need to worry about those. And, uh, but anyway, let's get to scenario special rule number one. All right, SSR number one. PTO is, PTO is in effect, including light jungle. If you're in the PTO and using the, the, the PTO boards per se, and they look like they have little palm trees on it, but that is not in the scenario card, you are playing essentially ETO rules. Regular boards, uh, the grain is, or the yellow hindrance is not kunai. It will be grain. Um, some scenarios, very rarely, but some scenarios involving the Japanese will not have PTO in effect. And so please be aware of that. Don't assume that just because you have Japanese, that it will be PTO. Terrain, rather. I mean, obviously they operate in the PTO. Uh, the other thing you need to look for, light jungle. Light jungle must be specified when you're playing a PTO scenario to distinguish the light jungle from dense jungle. If this is not included, if that wasn't there at all, then the jungle will be considered dense by default, right? Roads exist normally. Why, why, why is this necessary? Because in PTO, roads do not exist. So... Clean, clear, easy SSR. Building MV7 does not exist. Again, this one is a lot of terrain changing information in scenario number one. Building MV7 doesn't exist. We'll go over that one and why it doesn't exist. Building eyes Z5 is wooden. Um, that's just changing all terrain uh, to exclude stone. Uh, you could say all buildings are wooden, um, but if there's only one building, you could just mention the building. That way it points it out. The hill on board M does not exist, and with the beauty of Vazel and all the Vazel magicians that work endless, endless, endless hours. Don't say, all right, you can just do that really quickly. No, 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 no. I do simple bullshit it takes me a long time to do. These guys are making maps. They're checking LOSs. They're doing terrain configurations. Um, they're busting their ass at this for our leisure. So um, you can complain all you want about Vazel. You would be probably trolling. So uh, I started when the Vazel was in the beginning. It looked like complete shit, but we did not care because it was ASL on the computer. Yeah, so look at some old images of Vazel uh, on the on the dark web, and um, yeah, take a look at what we had back then. 
what we have now is practically the boards. So, and the counters, I think the counters haven't changed too much, but obviously some of the counters have a lot more detail. You could add names to the leaders, which if you don't name your leaders, again, you're probably trolling and you deserve to lose them with every sniper shot that they take. Um, so name your leaders and uh, a whole slew of other functionalities have been added in the last 15 to 20 years. So um, it is, it is a, an incredible piece of work. Anywho, continuing on, northernmost and southernmost hex rows are considered beach and are treated as open ground. Well, when it says the northernmost and southernmost, you better know your directions. Is that north? Is that north? Don't know. You better know based upon the scenario card. So the north would be pointing towards M. And since you, if you use Vasil, you're going to cut a loss. So you're not really going to know which direction is what. So make note of that. And when you're setting up the Vasil board, and you might want to throw on, uh, I don't know, gosh, you can't mark it immediately. But um, make sure you know what direction north is. Actually, it doesn't really matter because if you get north from the bottom, um, in terms of just the beach, then you still, you're still going to get it properly. But the entry hexes will be different. As it says here, we'll go over the end. We'll go over the setup in just a bit. All right. Um, so they are considered beach and treated as open ground. Uh, however, beach hexes receive a plus one TEM for non mortar attacks from non adjacent inland hexes. Um, so you might get a little bit confused about what an inland hex is. So obviously, um, based on my map that I created, you shouldn't have a difficulty in understanding what an inland hex is. Uh, but, you know, uh, sometimes people say, because it's not defined, I believe. So essentially, if you're not, if you're attacking it from non-beach, then it will achieve a plus one. So if you're on a beach, firing to a beach, you don't get the plus one. So, and that that essentially incorporates the um, slope of the beach, most likely, although all beaches aren't sloped, that essentially is giving the units um, that modifier there. Uh, it won't really matter, I think on the east side, but on the west side, you can take advantage of that plus one modifier as most of the buildings are huts and most of the terrain is just a jungle. So it's all plus one. So you moving in fast terrain, i.e. the beach, you'll receive the plus one TEM for that and be speeding along to your victory as well. Um, scenario special rule number two is very interesting. Um, Neil shared with me his uh, submission uh, scenario card. Um, obviously, a couple things have changed on it, um, but this one is super duper key. Um, based upon the definition, on games turn one and two, and you'll say to yourself, hey, that sounds familiar. Games turn one and two, look at that. Something must happen. Scenario Special Rule 2 identifies it. FFMO is NA. Is NA. Which means it does not exist by that verbiage. Okay? FFMO is NA. And all small arms, IFT, and mortar to hit dice rolls must add a plus one low visibility hindrance dice roll modifier. Okay. Essentially what that means is you get shot at, you're going to have a low visibility hindrance dice roll modifier. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure some other SK scenarios use the low visibility. The problem here is FFMO is non applicable. So, I hate to compare to ASL because this is not ASL. And Neil did address the precise ASL 
play that you have when low visibility comes into play. So um, right here, FFMO is not applicable. So the minus one moving in the open is a no-go. It doesn't exist. Not applicable. Okay. And so if you don't have that and you're moving in the open, FF at AM, uh, non-assault movement, you're going to have a minus one for non-assault movement. All right. But you have to add all shots, add the plus one, low visibility hindrance. So you get the minus one for a non-assault movement and plus one low visibility, which means you have a zero net modifier when you're moving in the open of your enemy. Okay. Zero net modifier on this one here. In Neil's submitted scenario, it doesn't read that way. It reads differently. So essentially Neil is duplicated in his scenario special rule, which is just as long, the ASL version of low visibility. And ASL, low visibility, does is not negate the first fire movement in the open. So you have the minus one for first fire movement in the open, minus one not assault movement, and plus one low visibility. So it's a net minus one. That's a big difference in this scenario when you're talking four firepower units. So note that if you're an ASL player, that is not how the ASL low visibility hindrance dice roll modifier is applied in particular scenarios. Now this might have been to balance out the scenario because maybe the Americans were getting shredded when they came in. Well, they got eight morale and they're getting shot up by four charts. So a four minus one, let's call it a four minus one. Uh, a seven's a normal morale check and a six is a one morale check. So what may have happened in some of the play tests, Neil did play test the living crap out of this, but may what may have happened in other play tests and they may not have liked it, is maybe sixes and sevens were getting rolled for the Americans and pinning most of the time. So that might be a problem. In a game of mobility, if you pin, uh, it's worse than being broken because you can't even move. You're just, just done. So that's the only thing that I can th think of in terms of negating that modifier completely in the SK system. So we're gonna take a, keep a look close eye on that one and see if it affects our gameplay. Uh, scenario special rule number three. Again, this is a beautiful use of special conditions which happened historically in the scenario. And Neil puts one in here and uh, I think it does a great job doing so. Starting on Japanese player turn four, which is halfway through the scenario. Japanese may make less than or equal to four, four firepower strafing attacks. These uh, represent the zeros or what have you in the mat. I think he spots it in the intro of the of the scenario description. We'll we'll take a look at it. Um, so, and that may only be executed at the start of the Japanese prep fire or defensive fire phase against unconcealed. So, if you're concealed, you're immune. Americans who are not in a building, hut, jungle hex. A hex may not be targeted more than once per game turn, which means you're not going to be shooting at it twice with multiple attacks because you can make four attacks. You can't plow four guys into it, which is very similar. I think if not the same as ASL. So a strafing attack against units at the beach receive a minus one dice roll modifier. I love that distinction because that makes their open ground, their beaches are completely exposed. Um, yeah, it's just, you're moving slowly if you're trying to run away from it. And uh, I like that idea. It kind of counters the mobility of the heck of the beach hexes um, and you get nailed for it. So very simple scenario rule, four attacks up to four. And you don't have to put it at the same time. You could do one prep fire phase, and then the next defensive fire phase, and then the next prep fire phase, and then, and then a couple prep fire phase or defensive fire phase down the road. Four attacks. I love it. Uh, the balance is six attacks. So six attacks would be pretty cool. 
So at the uh, number four, at the start of every Japanese prep defensive fire phase of everyone, if an American unit or unit is R within three hexes of MI8, which is on the, the centerpiece on the board, I think it's like a command center, uh, the Japanese player may make a die roll and a die roll less than or equal to three. One such unit in that three hex zone must take a pin task check from harassing sniper fire. This is a beautiful uh, um, use of snipers where there are none. It's a very imaginative representation of what sniper fires kind of do to players without killing leaders. There's only three American leaders here. If they just kill leaders, I mean, you would just win by this scenario special rule. So it just pins them. So um, great. This is a great thing. Randomly select from non-melee units. So um, so you just, if you've got six guys in there, you roll random selection. And if they're not in melee, then somebody gets shot and they got to take a pin task check. Nice, very smooth um, application of sort of representing what actually happened at this small engagement. So uh, sniper fire ceases when MI8 is initially controlled by uh by the americans um it could be ever controlled initially controlled whatever um if you take it they're gone no more sniper fire um scenario special rule number five the japanese may set up the crew mmg and one leader as a machine gun nest using emplacement and hip as if it were a gun so i would read that as the um, uh, machine gun and the leader, if you set them up and placed, that means they'll get a plus two modifier instead of the TEM that it's in. Um, look up 6.3, pretty sure that's exactly what it explains. And hip, uh, you have to be in place to hip um, to be able to utilize that ability of... Um, as if it were a gun. I'm not sure why it wouldn't just say hip the unit. Maybe that doesn't exist. Let me double check. Yeah, the snare special rule five, um, the hip and emplacement apply strictly to guns and not infantry. So I don't think infantry were ever included to be hip. So that slyly uses those rules as a, um, like a little sandbag uh, defensible terrain. I kind of like it. Gives them like a little plus two. Essentially what that does um, is allows you to hip a unit normally and consider it entrenched as it would be in ASL. Um, for the SK guys, there's no entrenchment yet. Um, that might be the next thing coming. Don't know. Um, terrain changing uh, stuff that might be in the works. But... Um, I think it's a, it's a great, another great application of an ASL rule, applying it to a medium machine gun and crew and leader. Um, uh, very imaginative and trying to circumvent some of the restrictions um, that is placed upon the SK system. So again, all the, all the scenario special rules seem to be very clear. Um, don't really have too much problems with any of them. Scenario special rule number two, with the application of FFMO's NA on turns one and two, it's probably a design change to eliminate any minus one shots on the Americans to allow them to close and uh, get in and on the Japanese player. So very interesting um, setup, scenario special rules. So with that, uh, again, five scenario special rules not, I mean, that might be a lot for a lot of SK scenarios, especially the early ones, but very simple to do. And if I were the Japanese player, I might uh, get some counters onto the side and make sure that you don't forget to use your aircraft attacks on turn four, right? Um, maybe the scenario card... Um, Maybe put like a little Japanese star there. Maybe. 
but technically the attacks are not units so you're not really getting reinforcements it's just an event that happens so using Vazel, i'd pop out four japanese zeros and uh stick them on the side probably use the bounding fire ones because they're colored and shit like that so stick it on the side and then as you're executing those attacks either place those units on that hex so you don't forget that you've attacked those at the end of that phase, you simply remove those markers and put them back in the box. Um, that would be an easy um, mnemonic device to uh, allow you to remember to use those attacks, especially if you got the balance. I mean, with six traffic attacks, um, that's pretty sweet. That's pretty sweet. And it'll be in a pivotal part of the game, four, five, and six, where the most of the fighting probably is going to be done. So um, let's go to the map. And uh, let's take a look at how we're going to attack and win as the Americans. All right, here, so here we are at the map. Um, I sure hope I did this correctly, but making the Mayhem S95 um, setup area for the Japanese is within four hexes of L7 and or two hexes from LX8. So if you're the Japanese player, and you have to understand that if your setup's going to be pretty much in this perspective as the Japanese player, the Americans will be coming on either the west side or the south side right here of board M. That's a big distinction. Make sure that you don't screw up where the south side is. If you just read south side and then think it might be over here and you set let's say these guys up over here and you start moving them on that's a huge difference in how the game is going to operate um, because you have to understand a the american entry initially how far they can go and then b their reinforcements and where they come on and how far they can go and your reinforcements as well so Let's look at where the Americans can come on and come on this edge up here. And this edge over here to this point. Now they can enter and then come down this way. But that's pretty much a full turn of movement just to get down to the edge of this hex. They can almost make better time running directly through the forest. And again, noting scenario special rule, there's no double time on turn one. So... Um, Japanese fire, most likely, unless you're firing the medium machine gun when it comes out of hip status, is going to be firing at long range, and it's going to be having a low firepower due to that, unless you're stacking units, and you don't really have a lot of units to stack. But you could do that. And what do the Americans have? The Americans have the potential to go straight down the middle, so covering the open ground makes sense, because going into the kunai is time consuming actually kunai is far worse than the grain grains at one and a half so you can go four hexes in grain with six movement factors but you'd have to double time that same unit would have to double time in kunai so taking that into consideration this probably is not going to be an avenue of approach this probably isn't going to be an avenue of approach and this most certainly shouldn't be an avenue of approach. Um, with no double time, you've got Americans one, two, three, four coming down the road, and they could potentially go five, six here. Uh, that might be a possibility. So be aware of that. Also, another distinct possibility is the beach assault one, two, three, four, five, six, and then advance phase to here or the G6. So that gets very close proximity to one of our objectives and it eliminates that little sniper rule as well. Let's zoom in here. So I placed a little sniper counter here to indicate that the little sniper exists at this location and so that's within three hexes, I believe. So the sooner you can pop that guy 
probably the better so you guys don't get pinned but it's it's a minor thing to look at so but it's there i mean you're there in two turns or maybe three at most so l7 is the other spot four hexes with an l7 so it's n4 count out four here l3 b5 b9 oops over here v9 and so on and so forth so pretty much the whole village no beach no open ground um it gives you a, a lot of leeway Spe specifically the four hex is down here so you've all, you've got that four hex of setup area whoops that'll be that'll fade and then you've also got two hexes with an x8 so two hexes could be here and four can be there you could legitimately set up a unit concealed here and the medium machine gun hidden there at the same time but does that get you what you want americans coming through the kunai unlikely um maybe movement through the movement factor friendly huts taking advantage of some of the um hindrances perhaps setting up in one of these hexes here to minimize hindrances but you're probably pretty much going to get hindrances on either either count and where else do we got so that's a huge if anything this is a huge movement barrier for the americans and they have seven turns to get what they need to get so if you survive to the point that you're an x8 y8 and z5 by turn four or five and he hasn't even gotten to you um it's going to be down and dirty there's going to be some close combat happening pretty soon uh these are uh another thing you have to take in consideration terrain effect modifiers where are your best terrain effect modifiers on our map walls of japanese we have a the emplacement but that only applies to the medium machine gun the crew and the single man counter that might may or may not be stacked with it and that is fleeting because if you move from that location you'll lose emplacement status so what do we have here this is the hut that's plus one plus one plus one 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 and that's it this is a regular building because it occupies two hexes two hexes a single building and a single building all those are plus two this is a hut because of this little guy right here. So most of the buildings there, this is a full building as well, because it's a single building, uh, unless it's a small building right there. I might have to move that. So you've got a couple key points. This are this weak terrain. The Americans will be able to shred you through that, especially with their leadership. So these are weak areas to defend in. These are weak, but lots of cover, so you can move fairly decently. Um, this one, in my opinion, is too far forward to the Americans because they can simply come down here and start blasting you in the advanced fire phase and come around the orchard and do the same thing. Blast you this direction and blast you that direction. You're most likely going to be concealed, but when are you going to fire? Probably defensive fire phase. You're probably going to take a shot. So that leaves uh, X8, two hexes with an X8, not a really big area. Oops, not a really big area at all, but some key areas, key location. Uh, this is just a victory point location. This might be considered a key location because it could fire down the road. However, there's one hindrance right here. Um, it might essentially body block movements this way, but I don't think so because no one's going to be walking through the grain or the kunai. They might skirt this way. But really, if you move that way, the only objective is this location, not really these two. These two should be simple to get. Um, so given that, I would probably um, set more units up for the Japanese. Maybe a unit, uh, maybe two LMG guys, two squads, two LMGs up there. Uh, do you want to conserve your medium machine gun? If you do, I'd probably set the medium machine gun up right here um two reasons little minor open ground area if the americans want to move they have to move around 
because this is going to be your bamboo, which is for all intents and purposes imp impassable. Um, so it will slow them down a lot. This will not slow the Americans down. You will get minimal coverage because you could fire through this area here. This unit can fire down to the beach here. So you get the beach covered and you can also fire on G9 with a plus one hindrance from this guy. So all those places are coverable. Four firepower isn't a lot, but if you drop back a four, uh, uh, four, four, seven, you get an eight firepower and that might amount to something. Plus, if you have a leader in there, those units are now going to have eight morale. And again, uh, this is a very quick pathway for the Americans to come. And it could be a very smart one to do. Now let's look forward to turn three. Turn three. We're going to have American and Japanese units coming on the board. So ignoring the Americans that you call that you have in the beginning of the game. Well, let's not ignore them. Let's just say, I want to send these guys deep into the Japanese area and see if I can get to these locations. Let's see how far these guys can go and what we can do to slow that advance up. So obviously the slowest positions would be starting here. I'm going to move the nine minus two, which is your power base. Let's just say we're going to take these units here and then we're going to move them on. We're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. And remember no double time on turn one. So that's it. And then let's go with, uh, let's go with an advance to possibly get fire from any potential Japanese. Let's say we had a Japanese unit set up here, but now we're just doing movement. So there or there is going to be the location, your choice. Um, and then going from there, turn two, the Japanese are going to move. They're probably not going to move in positions to take, take you on fire. Uh, minor adjustments because all your guys will be on board at that point. So let's go turn two. We go two, three. We have to cross this area here, four, five, six. And let's just say that's our double time turn, seven, eight. Assuming no Japanese are up here. Okay. So we can make it. Or we can go two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then advance. So we're up in this area on turn two. How far can we get if we go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, advance? That's pretty far right there. But at that point, again, if you are CX'd, the Japanese unit might, just might, because if that's turn two, that you're going to have the night modifier. So he could just move units to you and you're going to be CX'd and you're going to have the night modifier as well. So that's a good chance where he may jump you in close combat, um, especially if he's within two hexes of X8, he can assault move. Let's say we have a Japanese unit here. Let's just say one squad and he's going to be concealed. Let's just say we set him up in uh in uh, this building turn one. So he sees him over there. So he just says, okay, I'm just going to assault move and uh, just assault move here. Right. And then you move here, turn two, CX. Uh, let me find a CX counter. All right. There's a CX counter. And so let's just say we assault move here in a W7, We're still concealed. We don't lose concealment when we assault move in non, or if we assault move in non-open ground. So let's say this unit fires, that's going to be 20 firepower, um, halved. So it'll take it back down to eight, um, plus one for night, plus one for CX minus one here. So it'd be at eight plus one. And so you would roll your dice seven would take the morale check off. Let's just say he gets a morale check and that causes concealment loss. And then you can either advance fire which is a possibility, which there's no reason why. Um, and then you can just advance phase in there. There won't be any ambush, but you will have close combat and you, so the close combat would be, he has 11, you have four, that would be a one to four from the basic ratios. And then the hand to hand to kill number would be a five for the Japanese. So he would, and then essentially a minus one on top of that. 
So if he rolled a six, he would get a casual reduction of five, would be a full elimination of all those units, if he attacked everybody. If he attacked one unit, which he might decide to do, right? That wouldn't be too bad to eliminate one unit in this instance. Again, we're talking numbers here. Uh, if you go one to one, you might lose a little bit, but you don't want to stretch yourself too thin. So one to one means the base number for hand to hand combat would be, like to be a one to two rather. Sorry, my bad. One to two is a six minus one for counter exhaustion is a seven. So a seven would counter or would uh, casually reduce this unit here. And then, of course, back the other way, the Americans will have two to one versus the four, four, seven plus one or two to one even because the leader will cancel the amount of one. So two to one on the back side uh, will mean a nine for casual reduction on the back side. So uh, he's obviously he's going to do more damage initially to you. But if you can get that unit with a six versus a nine, especially if you broke one unit. Like I say, advance fire, break a unit. Let's just say he does low crawl, low crawls over here. Now, does the leader move with the unit or does the leader stay here for defense? If the leader moves with that unit, now your close combat with this unit is far better. So that would be a one to two, which would be a base six minus one from the counter exhaust to make it a seven. And he's a one to one, he, he would be a six. So that would be far superior if you actually broke a unit and caused him to rout. You would definitely have the advantage in that case as the Japanese. And you would take that. You would obviously go into close combat. So going counter exhaustion on the second turn is very problematic for the Americans if they are anywhere close to a Japanese unit or the Japanese unit could get close to them. Um, so that's something that he has to take into consideration. I, since, simply because it's a small map, um, I really don't think I would go counter exhaust at all, unless you're the turn three reinforcements, which would be these guys over here, just to move them up. But other than that, moving these guys in the heart of the Japanese defense counter exhaustion, it could be bad. So that's what you need to look at for the Americans and their movement and capabilities. So take that into consideration. So with that, if he's over here in 09, two, three, four, five, six in advance, you know, that's a, that's a decent position. It can threaten both Z5 and Y8. Remember this is turn two. And so if this unit moved here on turn one, do we take a plus two shot over here? Four plus two against eight morale units? Eh, probably not. We may choose to skulk and then go back inside or go to X7 and then go to X6. You know, if you had another unit coming this way. Um, so something the Japanese player has to look at, not really, or he can go attack directly. But again, you won't have that counter exhaustion on the Americans to give you that huge minus one that you'll need in going in one to two and one to three combat or one to four combats against these guys. So, uh, very dangerous and, and for, uh, throwing two squads in there, even if you don't kill them in close combat, you're going to be tied up. And if you're tied up, the Americans have a number of squads. They can come back over to your side, either bypass you and get the victory conditions, or I wouldn't actually throw any more units in with that close combat. Um, Japanese close combat is very deadly very dangerous and i would try to avoid that as the americans pretty much most of the time try to punish them with your firepower uh sustain your units with your eight morale and um and win the game by just being hardier units uh continued fire on these on the japanese units will eventually stripe them get them down to half squads which are still dangerous and then uh take them out that way so this is turn two. Let's just say the Japanese goes to Y8 for whatever reason or stays where he is. We really don't care. Um, turn three, the Americans would come on most likely. The, and these are the hexes that they may come on. Anywhere from here between K and Q, which is H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O-P-Q. So not really sure why you would ever put the guys over here because you're going to go through kunai and you're going to be slowed down so that 
that is not a realistic position to be in. Most likely you're going to enter here or here. Technically you could set them up here and just move this way, but you know, whatever you can go here. You cannot enter R zero first. You have to enter Q one before you go to R zero. Remember turn between K and Q, not R. So set them up here. These guys could double time one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then that's road bonus. And then you can advance from there. That's turn three. Again, that's CX and turn three from these guys could be one, two, three, four, five, six. Not bad because that's two hindrances and your night bonus benefits are going to be gone. And then your advance phase comes. So you could advance here. These units could advance here. And now you've got four squads within, I, I think this is the toughest position to get simply because it's surrounded by open ground. That's why I would probably force tons of units over here and fight hard for it. This will be easy to approach. Nothing's in open ground. All oh, there's all cover. Um, so it's a very, very approachable area. Not so approachable, but no TEM. Very approachable. And so this would be the end of America turn three. Japanese would then have these units come on in this particular area up here. This is a great stack because it's eight firepower, which is essentially equivalent to the Americans. Uh, I would never come down the road because of where your Americans are most likely to be. And this is most likely they'll be around this vicinity. So you're not coming down the road. Where are you coming? You're coming down the beach. So you're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six. Remember, scenario special rule states that fire onto the beach from essentially non-beach hexes is going to be a plus one. So the plus one moving and non, the non-assault movement will be canceled by the plus one. And that's not considered open ground because you have a positive modifier. So you could run down here, uh, possibly even run to AA5 and then advance into Z5 on turn three. That's, that's a possibility. And so of course you could have run this guy straight down the road, him in there at that point. But the point is, is you can get guys from behind it using the beach. That probably the best approach for the Japanese. So given that that's turn three, right? That's a turn three possibility. This is what the best case scenario probably would look like either that or you're occupying these guys just moved down the road. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Get good modifiers. That's a possibility. And then, uh, just stayed there and these guys would have to come on. So what would the other units be doing? Knowing that the Japanese, you're going to be in this area as the Americans, knowing the Japanese are probably going to come on this way. Could they go to Z3? Sure. Um, that's a, that's a, a extremely valid position and then pound this unit with eight firepower and he's going to fire back at you eight firepower. So your morale's a little bit, uh, your morale's the same. So it's going to be, He'll have a slight advantage on you at that point. But if that's the case, we could take these units. Down the beach. One, two, three, four, five, six on turn one. All right. He might rearrange. He's probably not going to confront you because you have way too much firepower. One, two, three, four, five, six on turn two. And now where are we with this unit? We can get firepower up. We can get firepower for the nine minus two and his units on an objective, another objective, yet another objective. And then we get, get to cover the approach of the beach on this side. So that would be a terrible spot for it. Um, if these units can commandeer this victory condition here there might be say three J japanese squads in this vicinity we should be able to handle the squads so and we've got four extra squads over here that either can, can accompany this so one two three four let's just say they here moved here in turn one and then turn two they're probably going to be occupying these positions here and turn three when the americans come on 
you know, this guy can be, hell, this guy could be way up here by that time. Or entering a position over here, or just staying there. Turn three, these guys could be slated to just take this position here. So things you could do as the Americans, the Japanese obviously are going to try their best to foil that plan. And uh, on turn four, so after turn three occurs, let's say the Americans have certain instances, these bad boys come into play really fine because guess what? They're four firepower and they can strafe American units. Let's say if we're here and we're here and we got two guys in here, we could have one zero fire there, one zero fire there, one zero fire there. And I would probably take the zeros and use them on units that are not in plus two terrain. So let's assume, let's assume this guy just kind of like, you know, assault moved up here or something like that. And his CX is gone by then. And then we're going to zero one of these guys. So, um, you're probably going to get a morale check or two out of any and all of those shots. So, uh, anything helps in that case. And four firepower is nothing to spit at. Essentially, it's a free free shot for four units. And uh, that'd be kind of fun if you could actually include that. If you could fire group. Oh, my God. That would be one hell of a scenario special rule. To be able to fire group with these zero attacks. So the zeros are coming in. And then you have your squads are firing at the same time. That would be, that would be pretty sick. Because that'd be eight firepower shot. That would be pretty awesome to be able to do. So, um. But that's kind of the plan there. And at that point, to be honest, it's just, you're just sludging your way through. You're just getting objectives. Uh, the Japanese either going to be clumped up or spread apart. Um, and then you just essentially methodically hunt them down. Again, the biggest, the biggest problem that you have here is if you have all your leaders up at the top and these guys start breaking in the village, you know, if you have one guy broken, no big deal. You probably could just leave him there. Right, and then self rally in another rally phase or so, and then you're up and going because you should be able to cover him with your other units. If not, you know, so be it. But um, you could potentially bring your nine minus two back and handle those guys. But again, because these are going to be plus two terrain modifiers, and the same thing with Z three, you need something to crack it. These could be eight plus one shots against essentially eight morale units um you might not do a lot of damage to them you just might not so uh nine minus two is probably going to be more useful cracking the egg back here could you um could you send the nine minus two back with these guys with a medium that'd be 12 firepower that would be a that would be a sweet stack one medium here with this guy's another 12 firepower that would be uh that would be very conducive that's, that's probably the better shot because you don't need a lot of modifiers here again most of these are plus one modifiers and guess what this leader here negates all the tems that are going to be in this village this leader here will negate all the tems that will be on this part of the map so that's a 12 firepower even minus hindrances of course the great shot it's a 12 firepower even maybe with a hindrance plus one great shot and then you've got other units that you could assault move in advance phase using smoke and other your other uh, tricks of the trade. So uh, given that from the Japanese and the American perspective, that would be a plan. Uh, I'd probably, again, run down, run down the beach, especially if he's got guys over here. If he's got the LMGs over here looking to cover open ground attacks, you know, a movement through here. That's a good, that's a good approach all covered. This is a hazardous approach, unlikely to come, but it's possible. You can come this way, you know, make him, make him attack or, or thwart him from moving that direction if you're covering the area. So on turn one, your units are going to be on the backside of the village. So these guys, oops, sorry. These guys are going to be moving one, two, three, four, two, four advance because or he can go around one, two, three, four. Yeah. Advanced. So he's going to be kind of out of position, but getting closer to the village. That's turn, um, one 
So, and then turn two, the Americans can move in their positions, probably take a couple shots, and then the fight ensues in the village. And again, that only leaves your medium, which is down here, and one squad and a mortar. Not a lot of firepower. So, I would probably, instead of moving these guys to the village, move them to, like, this position to start catching, defend the flank of your building and start catching the Americans. The Americans have to cross to get to here unless they take a different path. They could send some guys up this way. They could send some guys this way. But then a guy here, he just stays there, you know, That then he covers you from there. Again, you're still going to have knight on second turn. So you could take that into consideration. I'm just going to use the knight modifier to run by and get my objectives, so it's fine. But you still won't know where the meeting machine gun might be hiding. Logically, it might be an L7, I8, the objective hexes, things like that. But I'd try to pull a surprise on the Americans and keep the meeting machine gun hidden and uh, blast somebody where they least expect it. Probably blast a leader. I would target one of the leaders. Because if you take the leader out, especially in this stack here, um, they're not going to rally for a while. And you can take the other guys in close combat. So, um, given that, again, seven turns, I think there's plenty of time for the Americans to do what they need to do. The Japanese, I think, need to focus on certain areas. And um, I would maximize the TEM. So, therefore, again, ignore the village. Act like you're going to be in the village, but then ignore it. Probably maybe have one, two, four, seven, three, three, seven here. I don't know. And then ignore it and then run. And because 12 firepower up here is far more impressive than two, six firepower attacks. And then by the time tour, turn four comes along, let's see the Americans move up even further. And the sniper's gone at that point. Then, then your zeros can come in and hit them there. And then you can hit them with, let's say you moved over here with your units. Now you got 12 firepower blast on one guy and then you can have zeros attack and multiple other hexes at the same time and really try and beat them beat them down. If they break at turn four, probably turn five, if they break at turn five over here and route, again, I don't think I would route at this point. You're too close to the objective to route away because you won't make it back by turn seven. So stay on turn five. Um, you probably have to stay close out there maybe route here you're still going to be susceptible to dm status and then um again you've got a few leaders you got a leader up here an eight zero catch in here can he come around oh yeah I, I would definitely try that but any of the american units break because he really doesn't have a ton of units might be out for a while simply because they really don't have a ton of leaders and um that's probably what we're going to try and portray in the attack in the Make and Mayhem. So, and uh, by the way, this is a, uh, this little submarine over here represents the submarine that the Marines came off of, or the Raiders came off of, and of course their landing craft. So, just to make the map kind of, kind of nice. Nice and colorful. So, again, ELRs won't make a difference in this one here. Simple control hexes. Uh, not buildings, but control hexes. So, um, go, go, controlling X8 does not control Y8. It just controls the building, but not the hex. So, uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. Make use of your scenario special rules, uh, of course, that we covered earlier. And um, let's see who comes out on top in Neil Ulan's Making Mayhem.